the Lord tonight. Yes. The Lord, yes. Let's stand if we will. We'll give an honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. Oh, I love his name, don't you? Yes. I love the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love to be associated with his name. I love everything about his name. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong power. And the righteous can run into it and they can find safety. <clears throat> Blessed be the name of the Lord. Does anybody have a prayer request tonight? Anybody have a prayer request? Right. And God save everybody. Say that again. God save everybody in the world, especially that friend I work with. Yes, save everybody in the world. Because the Bible said it's not God's will that any perish. That's a wonderful prayer. Yeah. Dave is here, but his heart's not in good shape. And neither is his blood. And that God will touch both of those things for, for his his blood is not staying in his body. We went back to the hospital after he got home on Saturday because of bleeding. So, um, and, and that family in Indiana, Indiana or something that lost nine members in that terrible accident uh, in the duck boat that sank. Oh, yes, yes. yes That's yes. from one of our, uh, somebody had it on. Yes. There were 17 people. Yeah. Yeah. 17 people died. Yeah. Sister Jewel's sister was on the boat before that one went out. They had just came in and that boat went back out. That close yeah. for the cause. Right. God loves us and God yeah. hears us. Yeah. But God. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yes, sir. that's an awesome testimony right there. Yeah. Yeah. Let's remember the others. Like yes, that. amen. That's a tragic Yes, amen. Remember the people in Hawaii, the volcano? Hawaii volcano situation, yes. Some more? I got you. I'm just waiting to see it. Just got families and loved ones. Families and loved ones, absolutely. All right. Brother and Sister Barr, we have a special prayer request tonight. For them now they said it was okay for me to mention this publicly and i love doing this because god's going to move they have some witches that have moved in behind them and they're holding they're holding satanic meetings at night with torches and fire late in the evening and they're being attacked by demonic forces and voices the enemy coming in like a flood and we're going to bind together and believe god is going to change that tonight because the Bible said that he gave us power over all the power of the enemy. Yeah, right. So I'm telling Brother and Sister Board tonight, those witches that have moved in, God's going to move them out. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Anyone else? Pastor, did you want to? Okay, praise the Lord. We're praying over the request tonight. Uh, we just gave an awesome tell, or I tried to give a testimony. They were asking for prayer for the people that drowned in, in the, uh, the boat there. And uh, I guess it was actually, uh, what's the name of that place? Missouri. It's a resort thing in, in Missouri, right there around Indiana. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Brand, 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 yes. Yes. What's the yes. name of that place? Branson. Branson. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. Thank you, gracious. 17 people drowned. In a little boating accident on a, on a, a tour thing or a event they do in a boat. Sister Joel's sister and husband, who recently had gotten the Holy Ghost when we went to Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. The boat that went out before that one did, I don't know if it's the same boat, but they were on that lake and they had just come in. The next one that went out is the one that the storm hit. They were that close to death. But God. But God. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Yeah. 
Yes. Say unto me, 
Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. Yeah. He knoweth, he knoweth, yeah. he knoweth the yeah. way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Would you pray just one more time, Jesus? Lord, thank you for the word. I pray tonight that it would speak to our hearts, our minds, our souls, our spirit, or it's meat unto our bones, it's life unto our flesh, oh God. And we pray that your word, Lord, that was a life and spirit would get in us tonight, Lord, and it would move in our lives. Oh God, we believe you for something great, something mighty, but your word does not return unto you void, for it is powerful and quick and sharper than any to it and sword. And we thank you for that tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. You might be seated. Praise God. Our thought tonight is this the results, the results of reception. The results of reception. The Bible said that Jesus came to His own. His own. And His own received Him not. But to as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. I love that scripture. Yeah. There's so much meat in there and so much revelation. Uh, Jesus came to His own and and of course, we know that he's talking about his own people and the Jewish people. They didn't receive him, but as many as received him, as many as acknowledged him, as many uh, as believed on him, the Bible said they received something for this. They received something for this. Their reception of Jesus caused them to get power to become the sons of God. I want to tell you, God is doing something great and mighty in the hour that we live in. And we can all feel a stir in our soul. We can feel that uh, that's going forth over the tops of the mulberry trees, if you will. We hear the sound of the abundance of rain. We know that our God is moving and the angels of the Lord are marching and they're, they're here to help us in time of battle, in time of need. But there is only one thing that differentiates us from the world is that they don't receive him and we do. Come on. And let me tell you, there are great benefits in receiving Jesus Christ. Yeah. There's great benefits in acknowledging him. Hallelujah. Yeah. Great benefits. Acknowledgement is a great thing. It's from the word, it's going to sound quite crazy, but it's from the Hebrew word God. Yada, 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 yada. That's where we get that from, yada, yada, yada. It means actually to acknowledge. To acknowledge. In other words, yada, yada, yada. I'm acknowledging what you're saying, but I don't know if I believe what you're saying. See, just to hear a thing is not enough. There must be actions with what we hear. Just to say I receive it doesn't always mean that we're actually getting it in our spirit. Because it goes beyond just saying, well, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ and I know He's able and I know He'll heal, but just not me. He won't heal me. But He'll heal everybody else. That's not real acknowledgement. When you acknowledge something, that means that you are familiar with it. It means that you are receiving what you believe. Acknowledgement. Hallelujah. Uh, it means to know. It means to ascertain by seeing and to comprehend and to consider it's from an ancient word, a root word that means to perceive or to be acquainted with or to know. We get our word knowledge from the word know. Yeah. Adam knew Eve. He didn't know just what she looked like. He didn't just know what her beautiful voice sounded like. He didn't just know what she liked. He knew her. He had the intimate relationship with her. 
And that's what God is looking for in our yes. time. He is looking for intimacy between us and Him. Yes. Hallelujah. Not just to say, well, I know Him. But I'm talking about a knowing that goes beyond a mind knowledge. It goes beyond just saying something. There is a relationship between He and I that I really do know Him. I know, I don't just know about Him. I don't just know what His Word says. But He actually lives in me. And He gave me the power to become a son of God. And I believe that. I have acknowledged that. And because I acknowledge that, I have really received that in my spirit. And because I have received that in my spirit, hallelujah, I am becoming a son of God. Oh, Hallelujah. I feel like taking a little praise right here. Yes, amen. Jesus told the believing Jews in John 8, verse 32, He said, you shall know the truth. That don't mean you're just going to read it and get it in here. This means this Word is actually so intimate and so powerful and so real that it's going to get inside you and when it gets inside you, it's going to transform your life. You're going to have power to become this word that I am saying. Hallelujah. Not only the words that he spoke are spirit and life, but it is God himself that inhabits that word. It is the life that gets in the word. And the more of that we acknowledge, the more of that to, that we don't. I'm not talking about just saying, oh, I believe that. I'm talking about knowing the reality of the word of God. Knowing the depth of the word of God. Knowing the unsearchable riches of, of the grace and the power and the mercy of God. It will transform a life. It will cause you to hate things that you used to like. And it will cause you to like things that you used to hate. It will put you on a path of saying, ah, I'm going to know Him. I don't want anything to keep me from this knowledge. Praise God. Hallelujah. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. There is reception and acknowledgement. Acknowledgement produces reception. And the way you receive it or the way you perceive it is the way you're going to receive it because everybody does not see it the same way. For instance, the light in the body is the eye. If I ask everybody in here, you're not all going to have the same exact definition of that because we don't perceive it the same way. The real depths of the Word of God comes by the revelation of the Spirit of God, Him revealing the truth of the Word to us. When the revelation of the Word is brought to light in us, then we all can see the same exact thing. But if we have our own ideas and our own perception, then things are not going to be just exactly right. In other words, the light of the body is the eye. Does that mean the eye is the light of the body? Or does it mean that the light of the body in here is the eye? I believe that the light that lives in me is the real light. But some people think that your eye is the light of the body. It's almost a tongue twister, isn't it? Praise the Lord. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. To know something is to not acknowledge something as to be true. How do you know? How many of you know the Bible says that thy word, O Lord, is truth? Pilate standing there, or, or Jesus standing there in Pilate's judgment hall, and Jesus is not saying anything to him, and he says, don't you know I've got power to do this and this and this? And Jesus said, you could have no power at all unless it was given you from above. That's and then right. he begins to talk about truth. And Pilate looks at him and says, what is truth? Truth is standing right in front of him. Hallelujah. Truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth is standing there. But he cannot perceive him. And so he can't perceive who he really is. He can't receive who he really is. See, your perception of something is going to bring about your reception of whatever you're believing or acknowledging or looking at. You love him today or tonight. John said, we know Him and we know that He is true. 
He's not talking about just knowing Him, what He looks like. He's not talking about just the man Jesus. John had an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. He had a depth of the love of God. He understood that probably more than any other of those disciples according to what you read. He wrote more about the love of God. He wrote more about those things because, and even the Bible said that disciples who Jesus loved speaking to John. Now what was going on, I don't know, but I, this much I do believe that John really, really loved Jesus. He had a depth of love for Him that was beyond anything probably that you and I may even think or comprehend. It was such a depth of the love of God. He loved that Word. He wrote more about the Word of God. He wrote how Jesus was the Word of God and how God, well, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He acknowledged that, but He acknowledged it because He had such a relationship with Jesus. Such a relationship, he was the only one that didn't die a horrible death, even though they tried to kill him, tried to boil him in oil, I think history says, and he wouldn't die. You see what love will really do? Intimate relationship with God will do. Oh, that I might know him, Paul says, that I might know him. I, not just knowing about him, but I want to know him. And I want to be made conformable to his death. And I want to be a partaker of the fellowship of his sufferings. Because in his suffering, Paul learned that the love of God was manifested in his life. And the power of God would manifest through him when he was weak. God was going to be strong. Do we have that same desire to know him? Or do we just want to know about him? And patty cake and have church. No. I believe the men and women of God are sitting right here that really know Him. And not only know Him, but want to know Him more. And are reaching for more. And are pressing for more. And saying, God, I believe I can, I can reach into the depths of Your Spirit. And I believe that I can know You more in an intimate way than I've ever known You before. I desire a relationship with You. I don't want religion, but I want relationship with You. I want right relationship with You. I want Your righteousness. I want Your role of righteousness is on me, oh God. And I know the only way I have that is to really know you. Proverbs 3, verse 6, one of my favorites in the Bible. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him. Acknowledge Him. And He'll direct your path and your steps. To acknowledge Him, I must know Him. As I said before, not only knowing Him in my mind or my words, but in an intimate relationship with Him. To acknowledge a thing is to perceive a thing. As a matter of fact, the way you and I perceive a thing is the way I'm going to receive it. What you see is what you get. Remember that old saying? What you see is what you get. It's said to bring forth the true fact that there's nothing hidden. What you see is what you get. The zebra looks like a horse. But it's actually a wild animal that resembles a horse with black or brown or white stripes on it. Some people see a horse. Some people see a horse with lions. And then some people realize it's actually a zebra. Because they have learned by their sight exactly what animal that is. Now, if you don't have sight and you put your hands on this thing, you're going to think it's a horse. You can go over to this horse or a regular horse and do it and rub them down and they both feel like a horse. But there's a difference in them. And the difference is because your perception determines what you're looking at. Praise God. Now, the word perceive is the same word as acknowledge. Yada, 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 yada. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 4. It's the story of Elisha the prophet. Or Elisha the prophet and the great Shunammite woman. The Bible said Elisha would turn in often. He would turn into the Shunammite's house to eat. It said that as often as he passed by, he would turn into her house to eat. 
One day she said to her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God which passes by us continually. And when her reception level reached that status, something happened. She suddenly has a desire to do something for this prophet. She and her husband go out of their way to make what we would call a prophet's room on the side of the house. They build a room on the, on the side of the house, or actually the Bible says on the wall. And they furnish it with a bed, with a table, a stool, and a candlestick. Everything the man of God will need when he comes by. The old Methodists called it the prophet's room. They used to build these for preachers when they would walk and travel and ride horses to preach. They didn't have cars and automobiles and things. Her perception level eventually causes her to come to the reception level of having a child. The Bible said when her husband was old. I don't say about her age, but it said her husband was old. My perception will determine my reception. The way that I'm looking is going to determine what I'm going to get. Remember the old dial radios from the 50s and the 60s? We used to have these big stand-up radios, big old dial knob in the middle. And, oh, somebody shaking their head, I guess you're old as I am. And of course, in those days, there was only AM radio. AM radio broadcasting, established in the 1920s. It remained the dominant method of broadcasting for the next 30 years. It was known as the golden age of radio. Man, how far have we progressed? FM, XM, satellite, sideband, on and on and on and on and on. The golden age of radio until TV broadcasting became widespread in the 1950s. But an AM radio was more susceptible to interference and noise. Right. So you had to get used to fine tuning the radio knob for the best reception. You ever done that? Oh my, I had a little AM radio in 1964. My first one I ever had, I got it for a Christmas present, I think. Man, you take that thing and you lay in bed at night and I put that thing up by, by my ear. I, I'm sure it was battery operated, just a little bitty AM transistor radio. And if I got that thing tuned just right, I could hear WCKY, Cincinnati, Ohio, all the way down in Macon, Georgia at night. Man. I remember there was a black gospel singing would come on at night, and I would always hear this song and hoping that they play. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Boy, and that thing would start fading out and you'd have to turn that knob and get it just fine-tuned. You slowly move the dial one way or the other. Very slowly till you got the best reception till you could hear the best. That's the way our walk with God is. We have to fine-tune our senses. We got to get our dials adjusted just right to hear the voice of the Lord. I'm sure that Job felt that God was nowhere around him. He looked to the right. He looked to the left. He could not perceive him. And that's what we do sometimes. The test comes. The trial comes. The temptation comes. The ordeal comes. The dilemma comes. We'll look to the left and we'll look to the right and we can't find God anywhere with us. But may I tell you that is not true. That is not true. It is not true. Ha <laughs> ha See, he might not be on the right or on the left, but there's one place that Job failed to look. And you know where that was at? He didn't look up. He didn't look up. Praise God. Look up. Look up. Though a thousand fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, it shall not come nigh thee. Pestilence that walks in darkness will not distort my perception of the Most High God. Destruction that wastes at noonday will not break my acknowledgement of the Most High. I will not lead to my own understanding. I will acknowledge Him in all my ways. I will trust the Lord with all my heart. And that level of perception in the Most High God is going to cause God to order my steps. 
my steps are ordered of the Lord because I've set my perception dial on His voice. I have fine-tuned my Holy Ghost dial in on radio station 238. That would be the book of Acts. 238. I don't know if I believe it. I don't know if I believe it. Fine tune it. Fine tune it. Fine tune it till it becomes a reality. Till you can hear that voice plain and crisp and sharp. My dilemma's trying to destroy me, but God's voice is trying to save me. I will listen to Him. I will not trust in my own ways. I won't look up to my right hand or to my left hand. I will look up. That's where God is. God's way is up. Heaven is up. My redemption is up. God is not down. The devil's down. But I'm up. And you're up. And God's up. I will practice the principles of Job. Job who suffered immensely and lost everything. When I can't find him, if I don't see him on the right hand or the left hand, there is something I can do. I can perceive through the eyes of faith. I can acknowledge that even though I don't see him, that even though I don't feel him, I will look up for he is there and he knoweth the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. See, Job trusted God anyway. He couldn't find God. He couldn't see God. But he could trust God. I can't see Him. I can't feel Him. But this one thing I can do. I can trust Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him. And He shall direct thy paths. That's thus saith the Word of God. See, Job had faith in the unseen. We want to have faith in what we do see. Oh, as long as I can have it in my hands, as long as I can see it with my eyes, as long as I can look at the bank account, there's ten thousand dollars over there. Sound like it? Oh, yes. He had faith in the invisible. He trusted God, even though he didn't understand God. He didn't understand what he was going through. He didn't understand the reason for it. But he knew his Redeemer lived. K-N-E-W. He knew. That means he knew his Redeemer. He knew Him. He had a relationship with Him. That's why he could stand, stand and say, Though God slay me, yet I will trust Him. He knew his Redeemer lived. He had knowledge. He perceived because he was acquainted with God. When the battle's on, when my battle's on, when your battle is on, am I acknowledging Him? When the test is going on, am I perceiving that God is with me in the test? In other words, do I really believe God is in this thing with me? Do I really believe that God is in this thing with me? Are we in this thing together? May I tell you the answer is a big yes. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's never more... He's no further away from us than just the mention of His name. You mean to tell you why? He's not out there. He's in here. He lives in me. He lives. Christ Jesus lives in me. Do I really believe God's in this thing with me? Maybe I don't perceive Him because I'm not acknowledging that God is with me in my trial or my test or whatever I'm going through. The test, the trial, they will come to an end. They have ends. They, they don't go on forever. I, well, I may be saying that out of turn. Maybe unless we don't learn the lesson of the test or the trial, they might go on forever. But I found out that God's people are quick to learn. Well, I hope that was a true statement. 
I believe that God's people really do have the desire to learn and grow from what they have went through. That's what it's all about. God is not trying to kill us. He ain't trying to destroy us. He's not trying to hurt us. He wants the best for us. But He knows that our old stinking carcasses sometimes are going to get in the way and there's going to be some little glitch. There's going to be some little thing, some little fox that's full of the vine, some little sin that does so easily be said, some way that we just don't know how to get rid of. And once we get through that and get rid of that, guess what? Directly the next one. If we need one. I don't know what people need. I don't know what I need. I'm just saying, God, you know what I need. You know what I have need of. So you know better than I do. Whatever it is, you just help me with it. Praise the Lord. Yes. So the test are only trials to get you to the next level of God's glory. That's what God wants to do. He's, he wants to get us in His glory. Yes. And a test is only the trial to do that. When I'm tried, when I'm tested, I will come forth as gold. Yes. I will experience a greater measure of God's glory in, his, in my life. You know what the Bible says? Glory to glory? Did I read that in the Bible somewhere? See, we're on an upward journey, folks. We're on an upward climb. We're climbing Jacob's ladder. The ladder that makes connection between heaven and earth. The ladder that connects us with the spiritual. Jacob read about it in Genesis 28 during his flight from his brother Esau, running from Esau. He saw angels going up and down the ladder. Actually, a ladder, the word ladder is only mentioned one time in the Bible and it means a staircase. Well, it must be beautiful. Jacob saw it in a dream. Jesus refers to it again in the lovely book of John. Chapter 1 and verse 43. I love this. Jesus finds Philip. He says, follow me. Philip finds Nathaniel. and says, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote about. Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip says, come and see. You're going to find out for yourself. Yada, yada, yada. Jesus, <laughs> he sees Nathaniel coming. <laughs> you, know, you get joy in your spirit and make you laugh. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I feel His strength tonight. Laugh and do it good like a good medicine. I think it's healing my body right now. You know, you can get healed if you can start laughing. That's right. That's right. It's a medicine. God knew that. Let your way into hell. Maybe if we just change our attitude and begin to laugh about it, God will heal us. Woo! Praise the Lord. Philip says, come and sing. Jesus sees Nathaniel coming and he says, Behold an Israelite in whom is no guide. Nathaniel is amazed. He says, how do you know me? Actually, the Bible said these words, Whence comest thou? Me. Or whence knowest thou me? But Jesus' perception level meter was already working. Now it's going to cause Nathaniel to have a supernatural reception level. Jesus says, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Wait a minute, this man don't know me. He's never seen me in his life. What, what do you mean? When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Man. Nathaniel says, Rabbi, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Because of what Jesus saw, perceived in Nathaniel. Jesus says, Because I said I saw you under the fig tree, believest thou? Is that why you believe? Because I told you something about you that there was no way I could know it unless I was God in the flesh. The story gets great then. You shall see greater than that. I've come with a word 
for someone tonight, you shall see greater than that. What's that? Whatever that is, is that. You're going to see greater than that. You're going to see greater than the greatest thing that God has ever done in your life. Your perception level is getting ready to bring you to a perception level. Let me tell you, Nathaniel believed when Jesus spoke that. He had a, enough of a, a belief to get up and at least go hear Jesus Christ. Uh, not really knowing for sure, but uh, Philip had told him, said, you come see. That meant you come check him out for yourself and see if what I'm telling you is not the truth. Uh, hallelujah. But when Jesus spoke to him uh, and read his mail, he said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. And Jesus looks at him and he says, you believe on me, you receive me because I told you that. He said, but Nathaniel, you're going to see a lot greater than this. Get ready, get ready, because you're going to see uh, the heavens are going to open up and you are going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Oh, what are you talking about? Nathaniel would see Jacob's ladder. Let me tell you this, you can see Jacob's ladder. There is nothing impossible to those that believe. I got enough time, praise the Lord. Mark chapter 8. It's the story of the disciples in the boat. They forget to take bread with them. Don't forget about the bread. Take it with you. Take it with you. We got bread. The Bible says they had one loaf on board. That's all we need. Jesus began a teaching lesson there by saying, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Their perception level of this teaching was that it was because they had no bread. They were way off course. Jesus was not even remotely talking about natural bread or natural leaven. He was talking about it, you'll search it out. Actually, he's talking about hypocrisy. Because 11 of the Pharisees, later he says, is hypocrisy. And he explains that in another Bible lesson. So Jesus says to his disciples, Why reason ye because you have no bread? He's asking them a question. What's all this reasoning going on? What's all this discussion going on between you? Are you discussing because you don't have any bread? Perceive ye not, he says, Neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes you see not. Having ears you can't hear. Don't you remember? Don't forget to take it with you. Yes, amen. Up I'm pointing on the right side. <laughs> Don't forget to take it with you. They only had one loaf. Don't you yet remember? When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how much leftovers did you have? What are you doing with the leftovers? The leftovers are valuable. The fragments actually, it's, it's leftovers. Fragments, leftover pieces. When I break them among the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? Twelve. I guess one for each one, right? That's right. Souvenir. Souvenir. I wonder where I went. What do they do with it? What are we doing with it? Are we leaving it here? Come on. Oh, Lord. And then he says, with the seven among 4,000, how many fragments did you have? Seven. Jesus then asked them, how is it that you don't understand? Because they think their perception is on the natural loaf of bread and Jesus is talking totally about something else. Amen. You see what I'm saying? The twelve there with him, they don't have a clue what he's trying to tell because they can't. They can't. Their perception is off. Jesus uses the word perceive here in verse 17, asking the disciples, did they perceive what he was saying? Do you perceive what I'm saying? The word perceive means to exercise the mind. It means to observe and to comprehend to understand and to think. See, to get the real meaning of something, you've got to exercise your mind, your spiritual senses. 
You can't just focus on one thing. You've got to diversify, if you will, the very thoughts of your mind to see what God is trying to tell us. Asking the disciples, did you perceive what I'm saying? Sometimes, you've got to think outside the box. You've got to get out of the natural and get in the spiritual. How do I do that? Get out of the corner realm of thinking and get in the spiritual realm of thinking. God always operated in the spiritual realm. Jesus operated in the spiritual realm even though He used natural stuff. It was always spiritual things He was trying to get people to see. And they just couldn't get it. You, you have to observe natural things sometimes with a spiritual perspective. Everything you see is not what you think you see. Really? Jewel and I were coming from. We were coming from Kellis, Maine. The last Sunday we were there. I don't know if I told this. By the way, a seventy-year-old lady there got the Holy Ghost. And we were we left Kellis and we were going to Lubeck. Not the, the lady didn't get the Holy Ghost in Kellis. It was in Lubeck. Brother Hooper's church. And we're going and we're riding through there. It's a beautiful ride down Route 1 from Calvary to Lubeck. Well, you're looking on the horizon and it looks like the ocean. But it's not. It's clouds. And so Jewel is seeing water and I'm seeing clouds. He says, no, that's the water. And then I, I look and, and, and you get way up and then you're going down and then the water's way up yonder. It's an optical illusion almost. But I, I could see that it was the clouds simply because I'm kind of knowing what the water level would be like in my mind. But I'm perceiving that in my mind. So sometimes what you see is not what you're really seeing. They say you can get out of the desert and get dehydrated and, and, and start seeing things. Optical illusions. You'll see oasis out there in the middle of the desert that are not there. It's because of your body and your mind the way it's perceiving things. I want my mind to work in the spiritual realm. How about you? Yeah. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. So everything the natural eye sees is not perceived the same way as someone else might see it. Because the mind is a marvelous thing. It's a marvelous thing. Do you know that any invention... It's a creation of the thoughts that operate in the invisible, invisible realm of the mind. Something that's been invented. It didn't just happen. It was a thought. It was in the mind. To create something, you must first see it in the mind's eye. To create something, you must first see it in the mind's eye. Because your reception level of the impossible is only determined by you. I can't do it for you. You've got to realize that all things are possible if my perception of it is true. Amen. If you can believe it, you can achieve it. Amen. Nothing shall be impossible to you if you believe in your heart and doubt not. Anything is possible. You can achieve anything if you believe it. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Every invention that has ever been created had to begin as a perception in my mind or in the mind. And then a plan is, in, is initiated to bring the perceived idea to an actual, actual tangible thing. I've told the story about a friend of mine that God gave a dream. And in the dream, the Lord came to my friend in the dream and showed him a, a, a thing to do to enhance the 9-11 emergency system. He went and patented it. He told me this, Joel and I personally. He patented this idea that Jesus came to him in a dream and told him how to do it. Put a patent on it. Went to work. And ten years ago, he told me, he said, Gary and Joel, I'm this close to being a millionaire. He had his fingers together. He's got crews that go all over the United States. I don't know what it is. Jesus can come to you and give you an idea. That's right. <sighs> 
We need dreamers in this generation. Dreamers. Not filthy dreamers. Not dreamers of filthy lucre. But dreamers that will allow God's angels to ascend and descend on their Jacob's ladder. So the supernatural, the impossible, the unlikely will begin to happen in our lives. Uh, Job 23 and 8, Job says, I go forward and he's not there. I go backward, but I cannot perceive him. That's okay. But don't quit looking. Don't quit searching. Yeah. See, this scripture has annotations of operating in the future and of operating in the past. God is the God of the present. He's not the God of yesterday because there's no such thing as a yesterday. He's not the God of tomorrow because tomorrow doesn't exist yet. He's the God of today. He's the God of right now. If you're looking for Him in your past or even in your future, don't do that. He is the God of right now. Today is the day of salvation. Look for Him now. Perceive Him right now. I know Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Same. That means He don't change. He's not going to ever change. But that's just an analogy of His supreme Godhead and power. He is the same. It means He changes not. He has always been and He will always be the supreme God, the eternal God, the everlasting God. He is God and He changes not. Would you stand with me in closing? Would we quit trying to get God to come to where we're at and let's go to where He's at? Don't look at your left hand. Don't look at your right hand. But I encourage you this day to look up. Up is God's direction. Lift up your heads. Lift up your eyes. Look up for your redemption. Draw it nigh. This is a day of happiness. A day of great joy. A great day to be over super happy and elated in the Spirit of God because we are so close to Jesus coming for us. Hallelujah. Don't look at your circumstance. We should always be up, even if we don't feel like it. Even if our day is not going according to what we think it should, we should rejoice in the fact that though God slay me, yet I trust Him. I might not see Him, but I can perceive Him. I don't feel Him here maybe with me right now, but I know He said He would always be there. So my reception or my perception of His statement of always being with me is going to cause me to be aware of His presence. Do you acknowledge the presence of the Lord even if you don't feel like it? Even if your body is telling you something else? Even if your situation is trying to lie to you? Even if your dilemma is trying to bring you and take you in a different direction? Don't listen to that. Listen to what thus saith the Word of God is. He says, Though God slay me, yet I'll trust Him. I know my Redeemer lives. I am the head. I am not the tail. I am from above, not beneath. I am going over. I'm not going under. I'm going through it, and I'm going to get to it. Come on, keep cheering to the Lord. Don't, don't stop praising the Lord. Hospital. I said, no, he, we don't do hospitals. All right. 
And she looked at me and said, well, you'll have to sign this paper. I said, I have no problem signing the paper. Uh, I'll sign the paper. I refuse you an ambulance. I don't want no ambulance taking him to the hospital. You know, he's not going to the hospital. He don't have to go to the hospital. Praise God. And, and so I told her who I was and who my God was. And his nose will be fine. And in a few minutes, it stopped bleeding. And back to running the trails again. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I saw the same people today and uh, I said uh, see Nick's fine and they just shook their head but that's the way it is yeah. praise God we either believe in God or we don't right. praise yeah. God yeah. the Bible said, talks about when he was talking about the, the 12 loaves said they considered not the loaves and I preach a message, I haven't preached it for a long time, but I preach a message on consider the loaves. Yes. Praise God. Consider what happened in your hand. Oh what God has done. Yes. Awesome word. Yes, yes. Praise God. You stand again. I need a couple of ushers to come if you would.